Okay, uh, so my name is Louise Daly. I'm a software engineer in Intel, and my co-speaker is sitting down <laughs> in the crowd, Ivan Coughlin, who's our architect. And I just want to call out Balaji, who was my original co-speaker, but he couldn't actually attend the event. Uh, so I just like call him out. He would have been the machine learning uh, aspect on, on the abstract, on the, the networking side. So for those that are waiting for machine learning, there's not much in here. Uh, so today we'll be talking about what's in the box re resource management in Kubernetes. Uh, so the next slide is just noticing disclaimers. So the agenda for today, I'm first going to talk about the current status of resource management in Kubernetes, just a basic overview of how it works today uh, and what's available. And then I'll go on to the challenges we found that our customers had with this current uh, state of uh, Kubernetes resource management and why they needed it to change. And then I'll go into the steps we have taken with the community to make those changes. So these include um, features such as node feature discovery, CPU pinning, huge pages, device plugins, and NUMA. I'm then going to go into a quick demo of our experience kits for containers bare metal. Uh, so I'll show how CPU pinning benefited a networking workload. Uh, so that's the, the plan for today, and then I'll leave some time for questions at the end. So first up is, uh, a lot of you may know this, but it's just how uh, resource, compute resource management works in Kubernetes today. Uh, so we can see on our left, we have our pod specification, and in its uh, specification has resource requests for CPU and memory. Uh, these are the core compute resources available in Kubernetes today. So our pod's requesting uh, 1,000 milli CPU and 500 uh, megs of memory. So this pod gets sent to the Kubernetes scheduler, where the scheduler looks at the nodes in the cluster and decides where it'll place that pod. Uh, so it looks at the allocatable on each node. So the allocatable is the total available uh, compute resources to the Kubernetes scheduler that it can run pods on. So there's a total capacity available on the node as well, and this is for either the system or the kubelet itself, the queue processes to run on. So these are taken away um, from allocatable. Uh, as well as this, the Kubernetes scheduler will take into account the resources being used by pods running on the node. So in our case here, node 1 has 2,000 milli CPU and 512 megs of memory, but uh, 512 milli CPU and 256 megs of memory are being used by pod B, so it'll take that into account when it makes its decision. So in this case, our only available node for scheduling for our pod is uh, node 2. Uh, so that's the, the current state of kind of compute resource management in uh, Kubernetes today. So what's wrong with this? So uh, as Kubernetes clusters are growing, uh, heterogeneous uh, nodes are being introduced, so not all uh, hardware ca capabilities are the same across your cluster. And Kubernetes has no insight into this, and it has no way for a workload to request that it needs specific hardware or, or it needs a specific capability on a certain node. Uh, so we want to extend uh, the Kubernetes resource management to take into account the many different resources available on the cluster, and then enable uh, users to request that their workloads require a, a certain level of uh, uh, resources. So there's a bunch of challenges we've been trying to address, uh, mainly for uh, networking applications, VNFs, virtual network functions, uh, on Kubernetes. So uh, there's a bunch of these. So uh, some of them include uh, multiple networks for VNFs, high performance data plane, east and west, and north and south. Uh, and then we have ability to request and allocate platform capabilities, CPU pinning and isolation, dynamic huge page allocation. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see that one. It's device plugins, so a discovery. Uh, ad advertisement scheduling uh, and management of devices and guaranteed new node placement and then platform telemetry. So these challenges kind of fall into different buckets that we put them in. So the first is Kubernetes networking, data plane acceleration, resource management, or as we call it, enhanced platform awareness, and telemetry. So today I'll obviously be focusing in on that, that yellow bucket there of resource management. So uh, this might be a little hard to read, sorry if you can't. Um, so each, we, we've um, implemented a set of solutions that are all open source. Uh, we aim to get everything into upstream Kubernetes, but if not, we'll open source a, a project uh, for it. So for the resource management set, we have a node feature discovery, which is a Kubernetes incubator project. Uh, so an incubator project is one that uh, needs to get community support and backing and use cases to get pushed into Kubernetes upstream. 
So that's currently there since uh, November 2016 and we still don't know when it'll be graduated and I believe that the incubator may be deprecated so we may need to find a new home for NFD. Uh, and then CPU manager for Kubernetes. So originally this is an open source project by Intel um, that does CPU management with uh, Kubernetes uh, and then we extended that to uh, introduce some of those features to upstream Kubernetes as of Kubernetes 1.8 in September last year which supports static CPU pinning. And then there's native huge page support, uh, which is available natively in Kubernetes as of 1.8 for pre-allocated huge pages of 2 meg and 1 gig size. And then device plugins, which were introduced in alpha in Kubernetes 1.8 and are recently graduated to beta in 1.10. Uh, and then Numa Manager, which is a proposal to add a Numa Manager component to upstream or Kubernetes, but that's currently in proposal stage, still being discussed. Uh, so I'll just go into each of these in, in detail in the resource management bucket now. So first up is node feature discovery. So what node feature discovery does is discovers the capabilities um, of hardware configuration, uh, our capabilities on um, each node in the cluster, and then it advertises those as node labels, so pods can make requests to be landed on nodes with uh, certain hardware capabilities. So we can see here in our diagram, we have uh, a node feature discovery, uh, NFD pod running on each node in the cluster. Uh, NFD can be deployed as a daemon set running uh, continuously on each node, or it can be deployed as a one-shot job, just discovering uh, the current capabilities on the node. And it will then label the node, as I said, with different capabilities. So in this example, uh, our node two has SRIV, secure boot, boot guard, AVX, and turbo boost enabled. And then poor node one has nothing enabled. Uh, so then our application, our pod, can request uh, via uh, affinity or anti-affinity for labels in its pod spec. Uh, so it's requesting to be placed on a node that has um, SRIV and boot guard enabled. So then um, our scheduler will see that it's requesting this capability and it'll land our, our pod on node 2. And then uh, the other application which isn't requesting anything can land on either node. It's not a stop for landing on the node with the, the uh, abilities. So uh, I just want to give you a actual use case we have for NFT. Uh, so in the case uh, of your, if you have an IGB UIO based DPDK application, you don't want it to run on uh, secure boot enabled systems as the kernel doesn't allow it. Uh, so we can use something called node anti-affinity. So we match a label on a node and we say that we don't want to land on any nodes that have this capability. So this will give us uh, the assurance that our IGB UIO uh, DPDK applications won't land on nodes that they can't run on. Uh, so this previously wasn't um, possible in, in Kubernetes. So as I said, NFT is uh, an incubator project. Uh, so we're currently uh, kind of looking for use cases and what gaps it fills and whether it's something that's useful to the community. So uh, if anyone has good use cases, we'd be really interested to hear from you. Uh, the link is on the slides, which are available as well. Uh, so if you have any issues, please log them with us. Uh, so next I'll move on to CPU Manager. So Kubernetes has um, as you saw, a CPU resource, but has no way you just get um, certain slices of the CPU, certain time on the CPU when you request a certain amount of milli CPU. This might be enough for performance sensitive or latency sensitive uh, workloads. They may be required to be pinned to a certain CPU. Um, so we introduced originally a CPU manager for Kubernetes, CMK, which as I said is our open source project, um, which does CPU pinning with integration uh, of com Kubernetes components without making any changes to Kubernetes itself. So it basically runs as a wrapper program in your container and it uses Kubernetes constructs to integrate with Kubernetes. So for example, it'll advertise the exclusive isolated cores as extended resources so the scheduler can be aware of those when making its placement decisions. As well as that, it uses labels and taints to uh, taint the nodes that they're running CMK. And then as well, it uses CRDs for uh, logging uh, what nodes have what CPU pools and whether garbage collection has been done, what tasks have been cleaned up. 
So how CMK works internally then is that there's uh, three different pools. The first pool is for exclusive isolated CPUs. So in an isolated CPU, I mean one isolated via currently uh, ISIL CPUs. And exclusive means that uh, when a workload requests it, it gets uh, no other process is going to run on that CPU. So that's the first pool. The second pool is um, exclusive uh, or isolated and shared. So basically, it's a set of isolated CPUs that can run complementary workloads, so they're, they're shared, but uh, the understanding is that the workloads will work well together as you place them on this isolated set of CPUs. And then our third pool is the infrastructure, so it's just shared and unisolated where you'll run the, the rest of your processes. So CMK allows you to request to be placed on one of these pools, and then it will uh, place your container on that pool. Uh, and as well as this, another feature that CMK has is thread level pinning. So you can um, request to place your container on an exclusive isolated core, um, but CMK won't do the actual task set. It will leave that up to the, the process, so it can pin a, a particular thread to an exclusive isolated core, and the rest of the threads will run on your infrastructure pool, so you're shared on isolated cores. Uh, so the, the, one of the major use cases for it is your noisy neighbor. So uh, currently you could get placed, as you can see in the top one. Uh, you could have your performance sensitive workload or any workload running on uh, CPU zero, which might be a hyperthread sibling. Um, and then you'll have your noisy neighbor workload come along and land on the, the other hyperthread sibling. So it'll basically thrash the performance of your performance sensitive workload. So there's no way of currently stopping that in Kubernetes. Uh, so then with CMK, you'll obviously get your exclusive isolated core here for your performance sensitive, and then the noisy neighbor will run somewhere else, so it won't affect your performance sensitive workload. So then once we uh, open sourced uh, CMK, we worked on getting these features into Kubernetes natively. So uh, we worked with the community to add CPU manager natively in Kubelet. So what this does currently, uh, there's a static policy for CPU pinning. So if you make an integral request uh, for a CPU, so um, either one, two, three CPUs uh, in your pod spec, you'll get pinned to a CPU and you'll get guaranteed pod level um, CPU pinning. Uh, so we're hoping to extend uh, the CPU manager to, to take care, to cater for more uh, of the CMK features in the future. Uh, so as I said, the CMK is open source and available today, and then CPU Manager in Kubernetes is available of, as of 1.8. So next, I'm going to talk about huge page support. Uh, so previously, you had to manage huge pages. Uh, the cluster app would have to manage the number of huge pages available on the node, uh, manage applications, uh, how, many app how many huge pages an application is using, and then uh, figure that how many more they can run on it. And they also had to manage the huge table FS and just assume good behavior by applications sharing the huge table FS. So uh, we worked again with the community to introduce uh, huge page support natively in Kubernetes. So now uh, pre-allocated huge pages are our first class resource in Kubernetes, so you can request them in your pod spec along with uh, CPU and memory. Uh, as well as this, we extended the empty dir volume to have a huge, huge pages type. Uh, so basically this will propagate uh, a huge table FS into your container uh, of the size of the huge pages you requested. Uh, so this means that your cluster app no longer has to manage that huge table FS as it's uh, also cleaned up when the pod dies. So that support is there uh, as of Kubernetes 1.8 as well. And it's just, uh, it's just recently moved to beta as well, uh, as of 1.10. So next, I'll just give a quick overview of device plugins. Uh, so basically, if you had wanted to add your uh, device to Kubernetes, you would have had to fork the Kubernetes code and write into Kubelet to uh, give your devices to uh, a pod. So there was an effort made to create an extensible uh, API, so a plugin-based system, so that vendors could advertise and manage their devices in Kubernetes via a plugin without having to ex extend the Kubernetes code itself. So that's where the device plugin API came in. So basically, it allows you to uh, advertise the number of devices you have available on the node via extended resources. And then when a device resource request is made, a call is made out to the device plugin where you can uh, do any necessary allocation of the device to a, a particular uh, container. So you can uh, change the C group for a container to uh, mount in the device. You can change mounts, and you can uh, add environment variables. 
uh, to indicate to the container what device it's been allocated. Uh, so this is in sense 1.8, as I said. Uh, so it gives you, obviously, a better resource utilization and uh, reduces overhead of having to uh, maintain additional code. Uh, so, again, I'll give an actual uh, use case we have for device plugins in Kubernetes. So, uh, QAT, which is Quick Access Technology, is basically an offload card uh, created by Intel. And it allows you to offload cryptographic or uh, compression workloads uh, to this QAT card and alleviate stress on your CPU for other uh, tasks. So uh, QAT also takes benefits from uh, SRIV, so you'll have a single QAT device on a node, and you may have multiple uh, SRIV VFs of your QAT device. So uh, with the device plugin, we're able to advertise those VFs as available on a node uh, via extended resources. And then when an allocation request is made, we can uh, allocate the, the VF to a particular container. And as well as that, we can advertise the, the PCI address of the VF to the container uh, so we can uh, do whatever offloading it needs. Um, so that this code is currently, we're working to open source, it is not currently available, and there's also a slight limitation in that the device plugin doesn't cater for a deallocate situation, so we can't deallocate the VF at the moment, so we're hoping they'll extend the API to, to do so. And if you want any information on QAT, I've uh, added that, those links in there as well. Okay, so next is uh, NUMA Manager for Kubernetes, which is a proposal we've created. So at the introduction of all these components that uh, actually are resource aware in Kubernetes, uh, oops, sorry, uh, we need some way of coordinating their allocation because currently they're um, currently they're uh, they don't talk to each other, and there's no way of uh, communicating what has been allocated to a, to a container. So the first uh, case we're trying to solve is uh, CPU and device, which are the, the two components that have been added. So for example, uh, currently if your container requests that it wants to be pinned to a CPU and it wants to use a QAT device, there's no way of uh, telling Kubelet to uh, allocate those NUMA local to each other, it'll just allocate them. And so this could uh, affect the performance of your workload as it has to go over the, the interconnect between the sockets. Um, so the idea for a NUMA manager is to create an interface that uh, components that are uh, NUMA aware can extend uh, in order to make more uh, NUMA aligned resource decisions. So what this means is at pod admission time, um, the NUMA manager will make a call out to, uh, in this case, CPU manager and device manager to get what allocations it can give to that pod. So for example, uh, in this case, we can see maybe that uh, the CPU manager can satisfy the request on NUMA node 0 and NUMA node 1. So it'll send back that information to NUMA manager and device manager will do the same thing. NUMA manager will then read this information and create a best fit for that container, uh, but it doesn't do any allocation itself. And then when uh, CPU manager and device manager make the actual allocations, they can consult NUMA manager to get the, the best fit for the container. So then uh, the resources will be aligned. And we're hoping that the proposal is extensible enough that if any additional components are added to Kubelet or elsewhere, that they can extend the, the API and also be uh, accounted for in this decision making. So for example, uh, networking devices or uh, storage. So this is currently in proposal phase. Uh, we're also, as I said with NFD, if there's any use cases that you have for NUMA awareness in Kubernetes, we'd really like to hear from them. Uh, so I've put down the the pull request to the proposal. So if you have anything, that'd be really, uh, we'd like to hear from you. Uh, so then, so that's all the, the steps we've taken to extend resource management in Kubernetes, uh, both Intel and the community. Uh, we couldn't have done it without the community. So then uh, we created these container bare metal experience kits where basically kind of a best practice development guidelines for uh, deploying containers on bare metal uh, with an orchestration uh, systems such as Kubernetes. Uh, so they have multiple uh, components in them. So they have feature briefs, uh, feature application notes, scripts, benchmark reports, and demos. Uh, so they're all available online. You can download them. I have the link uh, on this slide as well. Um, so sorry, I went too far. 
so these are the, the four we currently have. Um, so there's a reference architecture, so that's the hardware that we recommend deploying on. And then there's three um, instances. That if you go back to the, the slide where I, I addressed all the challenges, these kind of each address one. So this is this one here is Kubernetes networking, telemetry, and then we have our enhanced platform awareness. Uh, so I'm going to give a demo of the enhanced platform awareness ones, and then you can run the other ones yourselves if, if you want. So the Container Bare Metal Experience Kit, you can download the dashboard. Uh, it's a Java executable, so you can just run it on your machine and see the, the results. So hopefully this will show up. Uh, so. Uh, so this is the dashboard. Uh, so it's kind of hard to see, but hopefully <laughs> you get the idea. So up here you have an information area, so that will give you an overview of all yes. the, the different capabilities in there. So if we go into the Enhanced Platform Awareness one, it will give you an overview of um, the different components. So basically what I've gone through, so NFT, CPU Manager, huge pages, and then we also use uh, uh, SRIV in this demo because it's a networking workload. And then it'll give you an overview of the, the impact of EPA on your performance. Uh, so then it also goes through, you can go into each of the components individually and find out more. It's basically what I showed you. Uh, and then as well as that, there's also how we set up the tests, uh, the information of, of how the, the hardware is set up, uh, the results of the tests. So you can see the benefits of running um, CPU pinning huge pages, basically enhanced platform awareness. Uh, with a networking workload, so it's a DPTK test PMD workload, and then the details of the test, so what we use to, to run the actual tests, the software. So then if you go to the demo area, we can see our, our demo for enhanced platform awareness. So basically, uh, on the left, we're going to show uh, a no based that noisy neighbor workload. So we have our DPTK workload running on uh, core two, but uh, on one of the hyperthread siblings, we also have our noisy neighbor running. Uh, and then when you use, uh, this is with CMK, the open source project, uh, we can see here we have an isolated set of core, or cores here. Uh, so our DBK workload is going to run on one of these, and then our noisy neighbor is going to land in the unisolated pool, so they can't affect each other. So you can run uh, actual packets through. Uh, so these are basically live recordings of data through that setup. Uh, so you can see that if you're using 64 uh, by packets, that you're getting 3.9 times performance. So you can see throughput packet rate uh, on both. Uh, so then you can go through each of the packets and show the different performance for each of those. Uh, so you can see with uh, 256, you're getting more performance. Uh, so yeah, that's everything uh, I wanted to show. And I'll take any questions. Yeah, so the CPU manager, if you request multiple CPUs, it'll try and uh, allocate you on the same NUMA node, but there's no guarantee. So if you request uh, eight and there's four and four, it'll allocate you the four and four. Uh, but if there's, if there's eight uh, on one socket, it will give you those. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's the same for hyperthread siblings. If, if hyperthread's enabled, it'll try and give you the, the siblings. Yeah. Go ahead. Does the device manager support um, view of the network devices as well as no. ones like the UAP? No, so we're kind of, uh, we have an effort to align CNI and network uh, manager to communicate so that we can cater for networking devices because it's kind of a funny area. Um, so we would like uh, for the device plugin to take care of the allocation of the device and then CNI to do the actual plumbing to the network namespace. Uh, but there's no way currently of those two communicating. Uh, so we're, the, the community are discussing a proposal to uh, maybe have a gRPC communication between CNI and device plugin so that we can tell CNI what device to actually plumb up for that particular pod. Uh, yeah, well, that, that would be kind of more NUMA manager job. So um, the device plugin making the allocation decision for um, a VF would have information on the CPU that's been assigned. 
Uh, so then it can make the allocation decision based on that, and then CNI is just told what uh, what to assign, what basically to plumb up into the network. I, I view it as more like an NUI delay extension to minimum, mm -hmm. because we typically have more than one PCI bus uh, Sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh. oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, thank you. A quick question. Now, what is the overhead? Is there any overhead added to the system? Um, in For any of the components? Yes. Or? yes. Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, the scheduler, uh, there's no scheduler extender, so there's no worry of having a HTTP connection. There's gRPC with the device plugins. Uh, node feature discovery is using uh, in cluster config to communicate with the API server. So I believe there is no additional overhead to the system that I'm aware of. Okay, a simple question also. Uh, is there any side effects of uh, <laughs> having these components? Uh, bad ones or good ones? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, good question. <laughs> bad ones. <laughs> no. Um, once again, not that I am aware of. Um, I don't, I believe, I guess there's a additional complexity maybe, but none of it's propagated to the pod spec. Um, there's additional complexi complexity in Kubernetes itself, but none of that is exposed up. So I don't think the user has any additional um, effort to make and neither does the cluster operator. So I would say no, <laughs> but. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, sure thing. I think there's one up here. Yeah. So this is all great, but I was curious if there's anything Intel specific about that that these extensions are using um, that may not be available in other manufacturers, for example. I'd be curious if I'm tied uh, to Intel if I use this stuff. We try and make a generic open sourceable solution so mm -hmm. that we don't tie it to a particular platform. Sure. But then for the case like with device plugins, we can use QAT and kind of boost that with Kubernetes uh, as well. We can use um, SRIV with our NICs uh, and we can with CNI and uh, device sure. plugins with that as well. Okay. And then with NFD, we can advertise CPU capabilities like a AVX and Turbo Boost. Yep. So we're just kind of uh, advertising our hardware capabilities using these uh, generic frameworks as opposed to I creating a, a bespoke solution. Yep, okay, cool, thank you. Yep. Sure. Anybody Any else? Questions? Okay, cool. Thanks, guys.